Hello, this is John Bassett. I'll take uh, take the start here. I'm going to change over and grab the screen. All right. All right, just making sure you can see everything. Brooks, it look good? Yeah, it's good. Okay, I welcome everybody. Um, I'm, my name is John Bassett. I'm the um, Executive Vice President of Managed Services for GSI and also our Chief um, Technology Officer. I'm a certified ISO 27001 lead um, implementer. Um, joining me today are uh, Brian Connor. He's GSI's Security Manager. He um, does application security, cybersecurity. And Josh Smith is our Infrastructure as a Service Manager. And, and does a lot of the, um, he, you know, his people and his team do a lot of the hands to keep our type of work for, for our, our practices. Hmm. Trying to get it to go to the next. There we go. Let's see. Today, uh, we're going to talk a, a little bit about, um, you know, some cyber security threats. We'll talk um, about the NIST cybersecurity framework and, and the ISO frameworks. Um, we will give you the five simple um, steps uh, towards the end after we, you know, after we go through some common threats. Um, we'll get get to our question and answer section. Okay, so let's just start with, um, you know, some of the um, 2019 cyber security threat summary. Boy, I'm having trouble with next guys. All right, there we go. Just as a you know a little bit of threat summary, um, and and the, a lot of this is accepted at, you know from NIST and and also ISO and any other most of the other um, management. An incident is a an event that compromises the integrity, the confidentiality, or availability of an information asset. So one of the first things you have to do in your cybersecurity threat model. I mean, I mean if you're in the ISO world, you you're going to, the first thing you do is define and um, start defining your information security management system. But the very one of the very first steps or second step is to build um, a list of your, your assets, um, and those assets can be um, they can be physical, you know, like a filing cabinet. Um, you know, could be gold sitting in a safe, um, but it could also be um, something that is electronic. You know, maybe it's programs that you've written and are and are selling. Uh, it could be contracts sitting in electronic form or in a scanned form. Um, so basically, um, you know, the, the integrity, confidentiality, and availability have, you know, clear, um, clear things that you can look at. Um, you know, confidentiality. You know, for instance, you go to go to the bank, um, and you can you can pretty much use all three with the bank example. You you go to the bank and you you have money sitting there and you want to make a withdrawal so you want your money to be available um to you um you know unlike many of the run on banks from you hear about 80 to 90 years ago it doesn't happen so much anymore a confidentiality uh extends to well you know you you have so much money in the bank you don't really want the whole world to be able to know that you trust the bank um to to protect your assets and as far as integrity you you know you're as an assumption you can say the bank um, has backups of of all of your transactions and 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 you can trust them. So those three things go hand in hand. Follow just about any methodology you might look at. A breach, um, it's an incident that results in a confirmed something happened, not just potential exposure. Um, something that has happened due to an unauthorized uh, party getting into your system. So data, um, it's based on confirmed breaches, um, not not incidences. But we did we did want you to know the dif the, the difference. So again, this a lot of this comes from the the um, Verizon document that we mentioned. You know, basically, data breach incidents are involve small business businesses, and you notice it's a higher number than public sector and healthcare sector. Um, the, the reason why it's um, you see such a high involvement in small businesses is because um, small businesses don't necessarily have all of the skills it takes to protect every piece of information or every asset they have. Um, they go for um, the the hackers will go for smaller 
um, you know, multiple smaller attacks because, you know, what's a small business going to do? You know, they're going to get lawyers involved. They're going to get the FBI involved. Maybe, maybe not. It's pretty hard to get um, to get the law enforcement involved in, in protecting you. 52% um, of the of the tactics um, are involved hacking. 33% um, social engineering. 28% involved mal malware and 15% misuse. Uh, the the threat actors is is an interesting um, con concept um, because it does normally come from outside um, of your company. Some of it's insiders. Um, Sometimes the insiders don't realize they're getting taken advantage of. Um, we'll talk more about that um, later. And roughly 40% come from organized criminal groups. And I'm kind of surprised, 23% of the breaches from nation states. I, I actually personally feel that number is higher, but maybe that's because I read too much uh, social media stuff. Um, mostly people um, doing um, breaches are financially motivated. Uh, some of them are not they're they're just like strategic to get an advantage what's your what's your competitor doing uh, if you ever get an opportunity to watch a movie called the inside man you will really love it um, if, if you're a security person it just shows um, one type of attack it's somewhat financially motivated but more trying to get the inside track on a on on a sale or a, uh, of a business or a takeover um, lots of phishing. I think that number is going to go up because phishing is getting somebody, you know, trying to trick somebody and people are still being tricked. Um, and a lot of these are staged. It takes months or longer to discover. A lot of the, um, a lot of the data hacks where um, ransomware type hacks are, you know, they're in your system long before you know it. And that's the thing to remember is, is that if you get a ransomware attack, there's a good probability they've been there for a while in your in your system, and you need to take that into consideration in your planning as to what you might do to recover from it. Some common exploits: um, st stolen credentials. It's a lot easier to get somebody trick somebody into giving you their credentials than it is to hack into somebody's system that has you know an advanced. Um, encryption algorithm to keep you out. So why why bother to break a, a very secure written protocol when it's really easy just to get somebody to give you what they've already they've got? Um, web applications are very common, uh, seventy percent. Um, some of them are based on email servers as well. Um, Backdoors or command and control are, are in a little bit lower percentage, um, and vulnerability exploits in ten percent. 94% um, of malware is delivered via email. Surprise, surprise. And there's tools to protect against that, which we'll mention. Um, and 45% are coming from um, Office-style documents, Microsoft Office, Google Docs, that, that type of thing. Some common vulnerabilities uh, that, that um, we see, mal malware and bots, um, which uh, you, you can think of things like, um, um, attaching to an existing web server. And again, some of those aren't necessarily tripped up as viruses. So malware is slightly different than, than, than that. Loss of productivity, loss of data. Um, I, you know, many companies, if they leave ports open, the next thing you know, you've got a malware sitting on one of your servers. Uh, phishing uh, is, uh, is, is an email type of thing where they send you a message. Um, there's phishing, there's vishing, smishing. Uh, phishing related to email, uh, smishing would be SMS on your phone. That's getting more common, um, although I've, I've noticed recently that uh, I've got a Verizon account and it, it blocks most of that now. Um, so you got to watch yourself when people are sending you texts, sending you um, email, uh, and even voicemail. Um, denial of service. Um, if you watch that inside man, you'll see a pretty good denial of service um, uh, attack in flight, really cool to watch. Um, again, loss of productivity, loss of revenue. Um, Brad Ware um, just said, basically said that, you know, the enterprise malware attack is up. Um, the average cost is about $1.1 million per attack, um, up 52% from 2017. So just, just keep that in mind, it's 
it's going up, it's going, um, it's not getting better. COVID has just given people bigger opportunities to um, exploit uh, your system, your people. Working from home, this is a whole new um, thing for many, many people. Now, it hasn't been a big thing for GSI. We've been a remote company for 15 years. Uh, we are, we're a company that has about 100 employees and we're in 29 states. We've been work, working from home, working from uh, small offices for quite some time. And depending upon your the type of company that you are, will will determine um, the tools that you need. And there's a there's a whole lot of material right now on working from home. We even did um, um, Josh and I did a webcast on on working from home and some of the things that you can you can do. Uh, I have a sister who works for Humana. And one day when she was out of electricity, she called me up and said, can I come on over and, and hook up? I thought she was just going to bring a laptop and Wi-Fi in and VPN. No, they, re they had a whole device, specialty device, um, that she had to hook up. She had to plug it in. She could not use Wi-Fi. Absolutely. Uh, um, and, and it's good if you're, if you're in terms of Humana. Good to know. They've got some really good protections to keep their, um, their, their systems from being Hacked. But you can look at this, some secured hardware devices by Fortinet or WatchGuard. They run in um, the home ones run in the neighborhood of five to eight hundred dollars, so it's not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. But at at the very least, you should use um, some kind of a uh, VPN solution. We highly recommend um, a company-specific VPN, not just everybody using what they can find and use two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication um, so that at least, you know, even if they get the username and password, still can't get in because they got to validate who you are. Um, and again, the advice is, is from to, to everybody is like, don't, don't allow them to use their personal devices if at all possible. Um, provide company assets if you, if you, you can. I, it's, it's dangerous to let people use their home computers that has not been vetted by your, your IT department, your security department, even small companies, you need to have some kind of mobile device management in place um, to, to make sure that they're not insecure. I mean, if you're working on your network from home, maybe the kids are still home too from not going to school and they're gaming on the system. Who knows what else is going on and, and it could interfere with work uh, and working from home. Again, we do have a whole webcast on that. It's recorded. You're welcome to um, view at any time if you uh, if you get with Brittany towards the end, send her a message that you'd like to view that webcast. So in the business world, there are a couple of standards that you can utilize to ensure that you've implemented a safe system following frameworks. And NIST cybersecurity framework is probably one of the most common in the United States. It is a US government-based framework. They um, promote the specs. Many companies in, in the United States um, um, go for that. Of course, the international standard is ISO um, 27001. And there's multiple stan ISO standards that go around with it. You know, 27002, 3, 4, and 5 um, basically um, establish um, auditing procedures is 27,004. Um, 27,002 goes into the standard for how do you implement the controls and 27,001 is the high level framework for defining your information security management system. So there's almost com um, a complete correspondence um, but, or corresponding NIST and ISO framework. ISO is an international standard. Um, many manufacturing companies have already implemented ISO 9001 or some variety, um, and, and therefore it, it's a good solution if you're like, say, in the manufacturing industry where you've already received ISO certification, it's probably a, a better model for you. But if you're just starting out and, and don't want to pay a whole lot of money for ISO um, products and think that you could do a lot of the work yourself, NIST is a good solution. I have, I have found that ISO is a good planning tool. Um, plan what you need to do for your, your security management system and then maybe adopt some of the NIST solutions along the way, so sort of a mix. You can, however, get certified in ISO 27001. Your business can get certified. Um, and there are only about 25,000 companies across 
across the world that have achieved um, ISO 27001 certification and it's something you have to maintain every three years. But if you've done it, um, some vendors, some clients re require it. So I beat that one up, we'll go to the next one here. So here's, I wanna go in a little bit of the, about the, the NIST framework since it is more common in, in the United States and it consists of, of 19 sections. And we've got them listed here for your, your review. We're not going to go into all these because this is not a NIST CSF um, webcast. This is something to help you protect yourself and understand some common um, common threats and how to repair it. But wanting you to also provide you with some guidance on an overall management strategy, NIST is a good um, is a is a good option. Uh, again, this is just um, you know wrapping up some of the common ones. We're going to talk a little bit about these. Um, these seven because we have some samples to provide you of things we've seen. Um, you can go to the NIST.gov and look at the cybersecurity framework uh, if it is something you've not seen before. Whew. Brian, is this something you want to take or you want me to keep going? So it's giving somebody else a chance to speak other than myself. Okay, Brian's on mute, so I'll continue. Um, asset management. I mentioned at the beginning of the, the webcast that one of the first things that you need to do in uh, assessing your cyber situation is, is, is to you know, do a risk assessment and part of that is listing out your assets. What do you have? Data, people, devices, et cetera. You need to know what you need to protect and you also need to know the risk associated with them. For instance, if you determine that if somebody breaks into a safe, um, the most amount of money they can get is, let's say, $2,000, do you need to spend a ton of money on insurance for that? You know, maybe the insurance is expensive. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe it comes with, um, with it, but you have to look at each risk and assess whether, um, whether the cost to um, repair um, is greater than the cost of just letting it go. So not not every asset needs to be protected. Maybe they, every asset does need to be protected, but um, you, you wanna look and find that. You need to make sure all of your devices are inventoried, all of your cell phones, laptops, um, entry systems, servers, um, storage racks, um, file cabinets that have HR um, things in it, um, may, maybe you have some uh, physical inventory uh, products you make that might, might need to be protected. Those are the things you need to look at it. Prioritize, prioritize based on value. Sort it in descending order on value. Um, software platforms and applications are also inventory. If you're in the software business, that that's critical too. So, This is a little bit more about the asset management. I'm Josh, I'm gonna let you take this slide as I did not put this one in. Yeah, so this is um, is actually one of the tools that we like to use. And, you know, to the, in context with asset management, um, sometimes it's really hard to get a handle on everything that you got. Like John said, everything doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, isn't required to have protection, but you've got to know what you've got in order to make that decision. And so, in the data world, um, there are a lot of tools, and this is one that we like, um, that, can, that can scan your network and, and report what assets um, are out there. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, it used to be in the, in the old days when you had um, Windows and Novell, uh, people would say, well, you plug a, a Novell server in and you forget about it. And I've heard of people that actually did forget that they had those assets. And so, um, having a tool that can scan your network, uh, you can you can see what's out there that you that you maybe don't log into all the time. Um, network Gear, for example, is is notorious for um, just kind of being sort of the set it and forget it mentality. So this is an example of a tool that that scans the network, um, reports on what you have, and um, and then can give you you know information about the status of that equipment as well. So not only are you finding what the asset is, but you're also seeing uh, sort of a security and, and health of that device as well. You can go to the next slide. Uh, 
again, this is just more information um, that comes out of those tools. Um, you know, applications that are on on the uh, devices, along with you know the physical hardware and and what the uh, posture is of the device. Thanks, thank, thanks, Josh. That that's that's a really good point. Is you don't maybe you don't want to rely on your memory and people's memories on on assets. Just run, there's some good tools out there. I know that ServiceNow has a um, has a tool that goes out and does it. They're not not always cheap. Some some of it has a reasonably low low price. I know the the, the tools we use has a um, is relatively low cost and goes out and scans the entire network. So I, I, I guess what the point there is, is don't necessarily trust, um, you know, start with the list you think, but then do a, do a quick scan if it's affordable. So on to the risk assessment. I've mentioned risk assessment um, twice. Um, and so this is the third time. Now we're going to formally um, talk about it. Um, risk assessment, um, if you want to look at the two frameworks, ISO and NIST, I'm going to tell you that the risk assessment of ISO 27001 is just so much better than the NIST framework's risk assessment. That is, um, and, and I am certified so in, in ISO, so I'm, I am biased, but a lot of the Google searches that you might go out there on risk assessment will tell you, even if you're using the NIST framework, you might want to look at the ISO framework for risk assessment just because of how it's done. And I, I think it the the one nice thing about the NIST um, and there are some advantages. The one nice thing about the the NIST risk assessment is is that it doesn't give you a whole lot of options on on scales. Certain items either low, medium, or high. Okay, it's very simple. But ISO doesn't make that determination. Maybe you have other categories that you want low, medium, high, super critical. Will our company will be out of out of business if we don't do it? You could do that with ISO. Less so with um, with NIST. So um, it's it's there's just some good tools there. You 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 need to understand what your risks are, what your organizational assets are. You need to assign an owner to um, the various risks and say, okay, you know, Jim there is in in charge of cybersecurity, but um, risks, but you know. Uh, the, another person is in charge of the HR filing cabinet. So you need to you need to document it, and that's the whole point of the risk assessment: is sit down with the various groups. Um, and and honestly, most people find this process annoying. You have things to do in your business, and all of a sudden, the risk compliance guy is coming and saying, "Let's talk." And you you need to, my opinion, as a certified risk assessment person, you need to have a person in charge, usually a security officer. Um, of some sort that goes around to the various groups, HR, um, operations, whatever departments you have, um, whatever departments you've determined to be in scope. Um, you, you know, if you're a very large company and you have multi-segmented uh, business units across the world um, with multiple departments, it's probably going to be pretty darn impossible in five years' time to hit every division. So you need to break it down into smaller components and assign different groups to different um, to different areas. You may also say that, look, you know, we're doing an information security management system, therefore we're only looking at IT. We want to set aside purchasing and HR for now. So you got to, and that's called the context of your, um, your system. It's like, what is in scope? And then what risks and assets do we need to be um, concerned about? So um, I'm going to, Josh, I'm going to let you take this too, because this is interesting. This is a vulnerability scan, but this is coming from an insider's viewpoint. And also keep in mind that there's an outsider's viewpoint coming from the internet side. So Josh, I'll let you take this one. Yeah. So once you've got your hands, your hands around, you know, what assets you have and you, you understand your sites and your networks, um, as John is alluding to, you you really need to understand what your vulnerability or exposure is. And so some of the tools that we talked about that can scan your network to um, identify your assets, uh, some of those also have other abilities. Um, and in this case, it's the same tool that gives you uh, your vulnerability or risk assessment. And so in this case, this is just one example of literally hundreds of reports that you can that you can report on. Uh, this one specifically is is giving a score based on a vulnerability that's found, and you know a number one through one hundred or you know between five and ten, those are somewhat subjective. But 
this gives you an idea of the severity of the vulnerability that's found. And it's important to put that in context, but in this case, um, you know, this example we chose because it's very common um, that, you know, people leave their, their policy sets where a, um, a screen doesn't lock after a certain amount of time. And so, you know, this is common. People walk away from their, their computer to go grab lunch and, um, and their, their uh, desktop is left wide open and, you know, potentially leaving it exposed to, um, you know, compromising information. So having something that can look at the way that your, your systems are configured and, and give you some sort of measure of what your exposure is, is really important to be able to, to make decisions on how to protect your, your data. And so this is, a, a, again, another tool, moderately priced, that, um, that gives you really, really helpful information when you're trying to make decisions about your, um, your overall security posture, your, your security policies. Go to the next slide. Again, this is like a, um, a, a network type of risk analysis and is incorporated into your overall risk analysis. Go ahead here. Right. And this is, you know, this is another example out of that same um, series of reports. Um, these are actual reports that we've run. And, you know, so we have the IPs showing their just private IP addresses, but um, the actual host names pulled out. But this is just another viewpoint, another perspective that, um, is looking at a few different things, an overall grade based on, you know, antivirus, are you running a local firewall? If so, is it locked down or are there ports open? Um, are you missing patches? All those kind of things. Um, you know, we talked about the, the screen timeouts. You can see that the one host there has an F because it does not have that set. But it just, again, gives you a perspective, something that's, that's easy to understand and that's easy to make decisions on, that you can remedi remediate vulnerabilities and, um, and make you know, intelligent and informed decisions on how you secure your network. Next slide. All right, Brian, do you wanna take this since you're our application guy or do you need me to take it? Brian's having, having trouble. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so data security, again, is, is another one of these NIST frameworks, and it's looking at the, the data that actually sits within your applications, and, and not just within your applications, but what's sitting with, within your network on your file shares and various uh, access points uh, that's available to any of the users. And are you managing the data consistent with your risk strategy? So you've looked at the assets and you've done the risk management and is it worth protecting one asset over another? Is the, the cost to mitigate it worth more than uh, recreating or recovering the information and, and the data that's on there? Um, and are you able to, to make sure that you are ensuring the, the triumvirate, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data itself? So you're looking at the data um, at rest. So when it's sitting within the database and when it's in the application, is it protected? Are, are you taking the steps that you need to make sure that nobody's able to sniff the network and intercept and, and look at some of the information that's going back and forth? Um, do you have the adequate capacity to ensure availability? You know, something as simple as disk space. Um, you know, if the server is getting full and all of a sudden no more information can be written. Um, so that's one of those things that you have to be able to uh, continue to look at. And then are you protecting against data leaks? Are people able to copy files? Um, are they able to export from your system? Uh, you want to go ahead and grab that next slide, John? Yep. Sorry, I'm struggling with the next button. It's not working. That's all right. Yep. Um, so this is a another report um, and another tool that we like to use at GSI, and this is looking at it more from an, an outsider's perspective where uh, the other reports that we showed you were looking at it from inside the network. We're looking at it from the outside. So we're looking at a scan of your external facing network servers uh, and everything that you have exposed. And so it's looking at, it's giving you a grade based on a, a few different areas. And so we're looking at things such as, do you have open ports? Do you have insecure open ports? Or have you locked everything down? 
Do you have your SSL configuration and certificates? Are they up to date um, and implemented properly? Um, web application headers, again, something that, that seems very innocuous and simple, but can lead to uh, significant exposure and, and cause uh, data compromise. Um, do you have mobile application security set up properly? I'd like to comment on this if you don't mind. Um, two, two things, open ports, that is a no brainer. Make sure that you don't have um, the some very easy open ports for hackers to hit. That's where malware is gonna come in. Um, they look for that stuff. I'll give you a good example. Um, I had to create a server on um, on Azure and it was just something I, quick and dirty. I just needed to get a machine configured. When, it was a workstation, it wasn't even a server, I take that back. Before I even had that server configured in Azure, people were trying to hit us with denial of servers attacks. Um, we had people trying to hit us on, on port, I think it was 389, the one that um, lets you RDP in. I had not even finished installing the operating system um, when those attacks already started coming in. So watch, watch out. Um, a little bit about SSL certificates and web application headers. Um, a lot of surf, um, web service providers um, don't, and, and website designers do not protect against TLS 1.0, 1.1, and SSL v3. Those have been hacked. Um, and when you talk to a lot of webs, um, web providers, they say, well, you know, if you've set your security properly on your web browser, you know, you could overcome that. Well, that's great. But what if you don't think about that? Do you think about your SSL certificates with every website you go to? Maybe you need to be thinking that way. Um, but I don't. Every, you know, I, you know, if I'm going to my bank account, I, the first thing I do is look to see that SSL is there. Almost every website now is using SSL, it's, but there, there are some that are still wide open. Um, you can protect yourself from the browser site, but if you're using an older browser, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, the thing, same thing with web application headers. Common thing is to, is to not um, properly set up your web application there's and it takes a programmer to get that set right it takes a web programmer to get um, to get it but again those have been hacked really sophisticated web hackers if if you don't um, go to you know, uh, you know don't have that checked out um, by an outside scanning site you're gonna get you, you got the chance of getting hit it's all yours Brian all right Good info, John. Um, can we run to the uh, to the next one? Next mm -hmm. slide. Yeah. All right. So the previous slide we had kind of looked at was looking at uh, just overall data security, and we're looking at this one is looking at protections against data leaks that are implemented. You're going to see a lot of the same type of things here across there. So we're looking again at open ports, uh, web application headers. But we're also looking at some other things. So is there evidence of an infection within your system? Are you, do you uh, have spam being sent out from, from any of your internet facing um, servers? So that's showing, are you potentially exploited with unsolicited communications? Are you showing evidence of malware or botnet infections based on certain types of traffic uh, that are going on out there? And this particular service, looks at a lot of that dark web and it's looking at a lot of the, the known malware servers and where the traffic is going to and where traffic. Did we lose Brian or is it me? I'm looking at cut off. Yeah, I can't hear him either. Brian's gone. Okay, I'll take take over. He's having a little bit of con connectivity um, issues, so I'll um, I'll move on to this as well. Um, talk to reverse that. Brian, you're breaking out. Okay, I am going to go ahead and let it head back over to you then. Okay, um, maintenance of the system uh, is 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 very interesting concept catching paint um, uh, cadence at, at the same time um, not not everything can be 
patched, if you're using some common ERP software packages, they have specific technical requirements. And pat patching um, you know, requires some thought process. In, in almost all cases, you want to take um, you know, workstation patches, you know, especially security patches, desktop software. Um, but on industrial control systems, even uh, back-end servers for ERP systems re requires planning. And you need a software development lifecycle um, to help you with that. Test the patches in the lower level environments first, make sure it's not gonna break. Um, GSI, many of you are aware, we, we are ERP specialists, JD Edwards, Oracle, um, NetSuite, and you know we have history. You patch a JD Edwards server operating system, uh oh, certain things stop working. So you gotta be careful um, with it, but um, in general, the, you, you want to make sure you keep your patches um, up, up to speed. Again, this is an outsider's, um, we, we have tools for um, vulnerability scans from the inside of your system and also from the outside of your system. And this particular viewpoint came from the outside, looking to see if you have exposures where your desktop surf software, mobile software, et cetera, and patching is not up um, up to speed. Um, now, a lot of um, what you've seen in terms of patching and maintenance um, is in regards to common vulnerabilities, so the CVEs. Um, you want to keep that in mind that, you know, CVEs and vulnerability scanning is required. It's great, but it's not the catch-all. Um, a good um, hacker might be able to get around some of this if they are, you know, if they they know about the CVs, know, know the workarounds. And that's why sometimes pen testing, um, you know, in hand in hand with vulnerability scanning is, is a good solution. Um, you might get a vulnerability scan that says nothing's wrong, but a pen tester might understand um, some of those web application header tricks and TLS tricks and, and get around it. More likely to try um, phishing and getting you to stumble by giving credentials, that's the easiest way. Um, but it's it's best to cover the CVEs, but that's not the catch-all. And we'll talk a little bit more in the future, um, later in this about tools for um, looking for bad behavior, not just common vulnerabilities. So protective technology, um, you, you need to make sure that your assets are managed and resilient, consistent with um, you know your written policies. And if you followed NIST or, or ISO, you have those written down. It's not to say that they're perfect, um, but the idea is to get them close to perfect, to follow good processes, to get your vendors to agree um, to provide you with safe access to their information as well. So you've got inside and outside agreements. Um, a lot of the access um, control is based on the concept of you know, least privilege, just don't give everybody keys to the castle. Um, and, and some of the vulnerability scans inside ones can uncover many of those. Uh, some people have like this administrators group that can do about everything and then they get real lax about giving too many people access to that. Um, you need to make sure that um, all of your communication protocols and networks are are protected. Uh, you know, even using SSL technology inside is, you know, now advisable, maybe 10, 15 years ago, people didn't do that. Web server, internal web servers should still be SSL based. Um, you sh should have email encryption, um, et, et, et cetera. Uh, and there are many tools to help you out there right now. So Josh, I want you to take this one since this is uh, a scan that you provided the data for. Yeah, this is a little bit more on um, uh, from the same tools that we we you know that suite of tools that we use that um, that are running scans and so protective technology. Um, you can't protect uh, if you don't know what you have and, and what needs to be protected, um, or if you don't know what um, what has been uh, found that's vulnerable. So in this case, this report is showing that um, uh, is giving a score, I should say. Um, for different, you know, perspectives in your network. In this case, um, the user groups that have full control 
over disk and you know, we marked out what the um, what the uh, actual host names are here, but it's it's just another view to show um, a perspective of your of your network um, in order to uh, to make decisions on, on protecting that. So um, this is looking at the security policy that's set up in Active Directory and um, and helping you make a decision based on um, on what you find there as far as permissions that are out there. What is the um, the control for those um, drives? And if you look here, uh, this is looking at Sysvol, um, uh, and it shows that. You know, everyone does not have full control, so that's a great thing. Um, that's a, a system directory in a Windows machine, and so um, again, we're getting a perspective that gives you, and you know, the information you need to make a decision over your uh, your assets. I'm going to have to pick up the pace here, guys. I'm running out out of time. Um, this is a similar concept, but it comes from an outside um, in um, looking at. Um, open ports, SSL configurations, um, a few new concepts that not, you know, maybe not all of you know about DKIM and SPF. Uh, those, um, you know, are related to validating the source and destination of things. There's also DNS, SEC, and DMARC, things that you need to look into from the outside world to keep people from doing recursive um, lookups of your of your system. Um, to try to you know do some kind of denial of service or try to hack cont continuously, and there are outside tools that can help you um, look for these common mistakes. Um, there's also a concept of, um, of continuous monitoring, uh, both in internal and external. You can have an IDS, um, you know, in IPS in um, on your system things you can try to do yourself. You could have something like Alien Vault um, as a SIM collector. Um, you can also use third-party tools if you're a smaller company and really don't have the money to set up a, um, a, a SIM or an intrusion detection, intrusion prevention system, and this can help you. Um, continuous monitoring is there to make sure. I'll give you a couple examples of GSI. You know, we have IT guys that Somebody will open up a ticket and say, okay, I need this new server created, goes through the process approval, it gets approved and all that. Um, but, you know, maybe you didn't contact the security administrator and the scan comes up and finds, hey, you know, you left a port open on that, um, that machine. The continuous monitoring will tell you about things that you might miss. Uh, and it's, so it's, it, it can be nice to have an outsider's perspective. You can do your insider's perspective too, but um, there's value um, there's value in both. So I'm going to move a little faster here. Um, here's um, um, a, some concept of, of some continuous monitoring tools. And Josh, I know this is your slide, but we got to move forward here. Um, this is, you know, you can see this is something where GSI uses um, Sentinel-1. Uh, one concept I wanted to bring, um, bring up with you is um, next generation firewalls and next generation antiviruses. Um, it's things you should consider. A lot of the traditional um, tools are just looking for common vulnerabilities. Common vulnerabilities are great because they've been all reported and you need to, you need to know about them, you need to lock them, but the, the hackers are getting sneaky and they're bypassing common vulnerabilities, but they're still exuding bad behavior. And the thing about the next gen firewalls, like, or excuse me, antivirus like Sentinel-1, some of the next gen firewalls, they catch bad behavior versus a common vulnerability. Again, common, right? It's there, it's out there, we all know about it. Um, but that doesn't preclude a, a, a very good um, hacker from getting getting into your, your system. So, and here are, again, some common vulnerabilities, things to look for, um, normal security incidents, insecure systems. Are you a spam propagator? If you were to do a, um, if you were to do a, uh, vulnerability scan of a company like uh, HubSpot, they're probably, you know, they they send out a lot of emails. They're going to show as a spam propagator, um, even though that's that's their line of business. But it also can find out if you've had any malware servers. A lot of um, a lot of um, firewalls and and you know, if you're working in a small office and you have a cable modem, um, those are subject to uh, botnet infections and malware servers, and you may not even know it. Um, because you know everything inside is protected, but your perimeter got whacked. 
So, it, you know, especially like one of one of GSI's offices, we put in our um, our cable modem router it was a very small office, um, and it was a five year old server that had a port open. It was extremely vulnerable. You got to, um, you know, we we contacted the supplier and said, can you update our 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 um, connection point? It's too old, we, and you don't allow us to patch it because we're a business, and you're not patching it, and, and it's exploited. So we we just had them update it as well. Uh, one of the things um, you've got to think about in advance is re recovery planning. Um, if you get hit and attacked by a system, uh, by by a vulner, um, by a hacker, and you have not had a plan um, in place, you don't know who to contact. You're just going to throw your arms up. Nobody's going to know what to do. Create a business continuity plan, a DR plan. Um, and business resilience plan if, if you need to. Know who the people are to contact in the event of a, uh, of, of a hack. Plan out what your communication is. You know, let's, let's say somebody calls you up and says the network's slow. Okay, maybe not a big deal. Maybe it's that one machine. It's not yet, it's not yet an incident. Third, fourth person starts calling in might, might be a problem. Still might not be a hack. But at some point in time where you determine you are needing being hacked and it's not just let's say uh, one of your routers got or your, or your load balancers power got cut or something like that or um, broke but you truly determine after let's say an hour that you are being hacked and that maybe you're starting to experience um, damage you need to have an incident response team even small companies need people that are in charge that know what to take over and execute a recovery plan if you do don't have it before an incident occurs, you won't know what to do. And not only that, your cyber insurance may not pay if you don't have a plan. So this is going to hopefully make you all laugh. Um, keep calm and carry on, which is absolutely impossible to do in the middle of being hacked. But um, just try to remember if you keep calm and do your job and uh, Get all the people involved that you need. Inform the proper people. Make sure your communications um, are open. Do you contact um, public authorities? Do you contact your 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 suppliers? Do you contact your customers? You need to know all those things, and you need to keep a calm, cool head. I've found internally at GSI it was good to involve our um, our um, legal team because they seem to be prepared for it. Maybe that doesn't work for you, but it did here. Um, I promise five simple steps at the beginning. Um, and this is from the NIST cyber framework right here, design, deploy, test, monitor, remediate, improve. But these five steps, um, if you do these five things the best to your ability, it should help you sleep a little better at night. And the first thing is make sure your endpoints are protected with next generation solutions. And we already talked about why. Um, next generation looks for not only common vulnerabilities, but bad behavior as well. Um, so those are your, what are your endpoints? You know, maybe they're servers, maybe they're uh, mobile phones, maybe they're uh, desktops, um, but you also need to make sure you protect your perimeter. perimeter. Um, firewalls, GSI does a lot of whitelisting. Um, we just say, you can't get it at all. That's, that's, the, um, that's the zero trust model, and then only allow people in that have been given approval. Um, Email, if you're using Office 365, there's some great products, Proofpoint, um, Proof ER from the No Before folks allow you some pretty good front end tools. Um, we found that a lot of our impersonation um, attacks disappeared when we went to Proofpoint. It, um, you, basically all of our, e we're on Office 365, but it first goes through Proofpoint point to valid, all emails go through there for validation. Uh, if you are a larger company, um, and or a uh, healthcare provider, a defense contractor, network segmentation could become very crucial. I knew an insurance company, they weren't even, uh, it was a, um, it was auto home life and health. They had everything, every, every data traffic was sat in a different area. Java sat in its own, if, Java, if you had Java traffic, it was in its own segment. If it was HTML, it was its own segment. If it was email, it was its own segment. Does make for a slow network, but they had it covered with firewalls in between. 
A um, lot of most companies can get by with just a you know a DMZ. Even small companies should think about it. Um, encryption, absolute must. Make sure everything is SSL. If you don't want to pay for the certificate, at the very least, do self-sign so that you can get encryption. Um, and make sure that you do VPN um, remote access to get into your system. I, I also take it so far as to say do some kind of multi-factor authentication. Um, do some kind of penetration testing, vulnerability testing, and, and rating services. Um, the next one, test your backups and your DR process. Uh, and also remember, a lot of those ransomware attacks, they're in your system ahead of time. So if they've been sitting in your system three to six months, you get hacked. What good's your backup? What good's your DR process if you haven't tested it? Um, and you need to basically document known good um, backups. What good is it if you've backed up a system and it has these vulnerabilities all in it? I think the last one we saved is probably the most important of all um, and because the biggest opening to your system is people clicking on bad links, educate your people. Um, GSI uses no before. Um, we've been a user of that for four years. Very good product. Uh, Brian's in charge of that team. He sends out tests all the time. Um, and your no before program needs to have some teeth to it. You don't want to just put that out there and people keep failing over and over again with no repercussions. There needs to be some kind of repercussions. Implement, um, you know, if you, you know, everybody's going to do it once. I've clicked on bad links, not knowing. I've clicked on attachments that came from somebody I knew that I shouldn't have clicked on. You're going to give people um, a little bit of leeway on this, but not a lot. And if they do click on it, put them through a re-education training program. Send them some links to uh, videos to do some further testing. Um, three, four, five, six times might be time to talk to the HR department and let people know, look, you're, you're risking the company here. Be, we, we need you to you know, take some more, more remediation take type of testing. Um, okay. Um, Brian, did you put this in? I do, can't remember. Brian's having audio issues. Um, so Secure Care is, is GSI's product. Um, threats have, have evolved. Um, we can do cyber risk management. Um, we could do network assessments and we can do security assessments and, and, and reporting. Um, we can help you implement a model. We can do a complete ISO 27000 um, implementation to implement an information security um, management system. So next steps, um, GSI for attending today and making it through the whole program here. Um, we um, are willing to provide um, a security and compliance assessment. Um, we have a one-time price for that. We will also do a free network vulnerability report for you on um, um, separate, mutually exclusive. If you just want the one, we'd be happy to, we need a couple days notice. Um, um, for for that, if you're a bigger company, it might take less time. But if you're a small company and not um, not known, um, we we have to wait for the scans to occur. Um, available to the first 10 companies, um, you know, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, one of the things that is that that we have the ability to do is look into your ERP systems and look at segregation of duties and compliance. Um, that is one of one of our specialties, and we you know we document our findings and provide recommendations. So final note, and sorry I did all the talking. I invited Brian and Josh and I spoke all. I hope you didn't mind. Uh, it's not a matter of when you will get attacked. It's a, or excuse me, if you'll get attacked, it's when. And prep, preparation is the key. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Brittany. Okay, all right. Well, we are running low on time. We do have a couple of questions that were submitted. Um, so I'm just going to go over a couple of those and then um, we can wrap it up. So the first question is from Alex. My company does fit testing. Will that prevent us from being breached? I didn't hear the question. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, my company does fish testing. Will that prevent us from being breached? 
Um, great, great question. Um, no, the answer is no. It, it will not help you from being breached. It will, however, reduce your chances of, of, of being breached because you will have educated your people. Um, it's a constant cycle though. You can't just te um, do testing and assume that everybody, you know, because the attackers change their strategies, make their messages look more and more like legitimate emails. So it will not prevent it, but it'll help. Okay, and the last question that we have is from Sandra. Should my company work to achieve compliance with NIST standards, or is there another one we should look for? Um, NIST is a great starting place, especially if you're in the United States. There, there are many out there depending upon your um, your organization. There's ISO 27000 series. Um, there's COBIT if if you're just looking for IT standards. Um, ITIL if you're just looking to put in a, a, a framework of oper operation. Um, there, you know, there's FISMA if you're in the federal government. So there are many, many different compliance standards that you, you can follow. Awesome, thank you. And I am just gonna cover a, a couple of follow-up items from the webcast here. And I just thank Brian, John, and Josh for um, the demonstration today. GSI provides a extensive free educational resources, including our edu weekly educational webcast, our monthly newsletter called the GSI Insider, our online resource center where you can access our on-demand webcast, white papers, etc., YouTube videos, and on-site and virtual workshops. If you would like to sign for, up for our weekly reminders for upcoming webcasts, our monthly newsletter, or create an account to access our resource center, go to getgsi.com. Go to resources and events on the main menu, select your platform, and select the appropriate link on the right. We will be conducting a hands-on workshop, uh, virtual JD Edwards upgrade workshop on July 15th. Oh, I changed, sorry about that. Where you will learn okay. everything from Oracle's roadmap on JD Edwards to performing hands-on exercises covering UX1. So my, I'm not I'm not the only one that had a next button not working right I now. I know, it just keeps going on and on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go ahead. If you check out our ERP talk, which is our problem solving forum where you can get um, your JD Edwards and other enterprise application questions answered, as well as uh, contribute your answers to others' questions. Stay connected with us on social media. All of our handles are currently listed on the screen. You can see our most up-to-date Posts on webcasts, events, industry insights, and so much more. All right, and we already covered the question and answer. So again, we thank everybody for attending the webcast. As a follow-up, um, if you could, could complete a short minute one one minute survey when you exit, you'll receive a link with the resource center with an access from the recording from today's webcast, as well as a copy of the presentation. After today's webcast, we'll do the drawing for the $25 Amazon gift card. Anyone that attended the entire webcast will be eligible, and we will notify the winner. And again, we thank everybody for attending our webcast today. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you so much.